So welcome everybody to the Abu Leadership Session. And it's absolutely great to have you here. I'm Lucy Makara. I'm the founder of Rethink Press of Book Magic AI and the Business Book Awards. And I'm absolutely thrilled this week to have with us Melanie Gao, Mel. So welcome, Mel. Mel is a published author, a TEDx speaker, and she was the first British female film director with an independent feature in the cinemas. That is a really amazing um, thing to, uh, to, to say. Um, Mel is also, well, she says that she is surprised to find herself to be a, pro a, a business productivity coach. Um, and what she's doing now is a particular piece of research. It's so fascinating, um, helping to identify open loop fatigue so that people can create the outcomes they want for their life by helping them think more clearly, organize and get into action that matters. So that's what you're going to talk about today, Mel, and share your latest findings with us. So over to you. Thank you for being here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for hosting me, Lucy. As you know, we have known each other a while, so it's always a great honor to be asked by you. And hello to some very, very familiar faces here today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Don, Rachel, long time no see, Heather, Michelle. So good to see you. I'm going to um, share my screen. And, oh, and by the way, hello to everybody on replay as well. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get on with this. Um, there we go. Now, this is how this works. I have to go and then go up here and then I can press play once all of that stuff disappears. Don't you just love Zoom? I do actually, I do love Zoom. Oh my goodness me, it's dropped down again, hang on. It always happens when you don't want it to, don't worry. It does, here we go. So here we are with why the modern mind struggles and the surprising power of story to solve it. What I want you to imagine is that you are standing in a yellow wood where two roads diverge. And at the end of both roads is exactly the same 10 years. But down one road, it's beautiful. There's a sense of spaciousness and time. And we're really deeply engaged in work that we enjoy. Our minds are clear and focused and we feel well and we enjoy life. Down the other road is exactly the same 10 years, but we feel overwhelmed, creatively blocked. We're struggling to make decisions even about simple things. There are a thousand tabs open on, in our mind and we are exhausted, but we can't even seem to relax or switch our mind off. Mel, I'm just going to interrupt you at that point, talking about tabs that are open. We are actually seeing your preview screen as well as the main screen. I don't know if if it matters too much, but we're we're yeah, seeing in some way. I don't know how to stop that right now. <laughs> no, well, that's fine. Right. So you know we're, what? We're going to go down well. It's well. perfectly fine that, but just know that we can see what your next slide is as well as you. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's, it's giving us an extra open loop to consider. Maybe I'm promising closure of a loop. <laughs> so let's go with it. These things happen, and I'm sure it would take me far too long to work it all out. Absolutely. And anticipation, we'll call it anticipation. So here we are, where we are at the at that road where it diverges is what I call open loop fatigue. So what is open loop fatigue? Well, I'm so glad you asked. If you have ever found yourself saying, when I have time, I will do X, Y, Z. I don't have time. I wish I had an extra day in the week. Time is the most important thing to me right now. You're probably experiencing open loop fatigue. I will say time is a feeling inside and that's part of the process. But if you're remotely juggling too many projects, don't find there is enough time in the day, don't know how to prioritize, then you know what open loop fatigue feels like. What it really is, is a feeling of being pulled in all directions into the past with replay loops or even those things that you want to do, but you won't do them. You would love to do them, but you don't do them. And into the future, 
where actually, to be fair, it's the relentless uh, to do list that just never get to the end of in that relentless work home, work from home cycle. But there's also the someday maybe loops. And those are the things that you will do when you are rich, when you are successful, when the kids are grown, when you're thin. Um, but it's not our fault. It's the result of a 21st century environment. It is entirely peculiar to the human species. And it's really about our relationship with time being distorted in a way that hasn't been done since Newton uh, explained the physics to us. I don't have to tell you that we're living in a unique time in history. It's digital, it's globalized, it's constantly advancing, it's filled with uncertainty, immense pace, limitless possibilities. And it is all caused by a stacking trifecta of network computers and technology, the industrialization of decision-making and the managerial revolution. But most importantly, there's a reason why now we're at a very critical time. And that is welcome to the attention economy. This is where your focus, the most valued commodity, is being leveraged by very smart people, some of the greatest minds of a generation. They are paid a lot of money to figure out how to get you to click. Uh, and then you give a little slice of your very precious life away for their profit. And they are, they are basically weaponizing what is known as our reward system to get you chasing dopamine down to their bottom line. Now, the mechanism that is in play is actually primal. For example, if you saw a bear in the woods, you would not be comfortable, especially if you suddenly lost sight of it. You would need to know that the bear was not just out of sight, but that it had you were out of danger. So according to psychology, this is a cognitive tension that creates a loop, or it's the cognitive tension is created by opening a loop. And that makes the information accessible. So the bear, and you can now access that anytime you want and keep an eye on where the bear is so that you know whether you are out of danger because apparently survival is incredibly important to our evolution. So that's the piece that's in play, but beyond all of the increased demands on your productivity, you now have a new seductive draw on your concentration of raw attentional capture. And what's really fascinating about this is who here has picked up their phone and lost hours to scrolling? Not counting myself out here, right? So the attention economy is opening up loops and leaving them open and at some point that open loop created by the scrolling slips into a high that feels really similar to meditation that's when the time just disappears it's a cognitive outcome that is fun but it's the cognitive outcome that is fundamentally different both are trance states um, but one is a passive trance. And I learned from my first book, Toasters Don't Roast Chickens, which is one long argument for the power of better choices and the role of nutrition for health, um, that a really nutritious diet can keep you fueled and healthy. So you can think of meditation like a nutritious loop that keeps you functioning at your optimal level. Um, but... <laughs> scrolling or the attention economy is like feeding your mind on junk loops. That's why I call them junk loops. Um, just like you can't eat a salad on Monday and then eat burgers and uh, biscuits and lollipops for the rest of the week and keep healthy. The more time we spend in that passive trance, the more the brain actually adapts to seeking frequent shallow en engagement. And it creates a very subtle change in the pattern of our behavior that alters how we interact with the world. So interestingly enough, we have not really evolved <laughs> um, to cope with this. 
The tyranny of productivity combined with raw attentional capture is opening loops that are like ghost bears in the wood. And because we have not evolved the skills or haven't learned the skills because we didn't know we needed to, because it came at us so fast, we've actually got a thousand bears uh, stalking the forests of our minds that we're trying to keep a, ta a tab on and we're feeding them on junk loops. So we're anxious, we're distracted, we're on a mental sugar rush and we're being stalked by ghost bears. So it's no wonder it feels like this. And that is why the modern mind struggles. And the great news is it doesn't have to be this way. There is hope because we do have a choice. We can choose that beautiful path today. We can go from this to this. I can tell you that the feeling of time is possible. This is possible. Yes, this is where I live, but I do feel a clarity and a wellness and a, and a balance. Even though I have a leadership role, I work full time on different time zones. I have a business. I have to write 40,000 these workshops, running research. And, you know, you know how the story goes. I've still got to walk the dog, right? So I just want you to know that this is possible. Now, I appreciate most of you know me, but just in case there's anybody who doesn't, I'm Coach Mel. I took one of those courses about how to look 10 years younger, and apparently nobody can resist a smile. I didn't take that course. Um, yes, all these logos are true. They're my bragging rights. But as Lucy said, I started out as a director. Um, and I tell you that for a reason, because that's why I could identify open loop fatigue. As a screenwriter and director, I spent years mastering the art of opening loops, curiosity, and how to close them in just the right moment was a core part of the craft. When I became a mother, my eldest child was chronically ill with allergies and asthma. And that's when I learned the power of informed questions, which is curiosity, the vital role of nutrition, hence I can see the junk loops, um, and the role of story in our health. I wrote my first book, Toasters Don't Roast Chickens. I think you can still get that online. It was certainly available in all good bookstores. I'm a single mom. I have been for 20 years. I learned a lot about maxing out on productivity. And I've learned a lot that contributes to the solution when I walked my sons across Spain for 33 days, 800 kilometers. Um, that's the focus of my TED talk. You can see that there. Don't go now. That would be called a distraction. Stay here. Stay focused. Um, but reflecting on that walk was pivotal to my realization that storytelling skills are honed in film. Opening and closing loops with precision helped me navigate life. And that contributed to pioneering open loop fatigue solutions. Briefly, my resume is I'm very proud of the people that I've helped to achieve what their goals that they want to achieve. But like anything else, there is the flip side. The thing that pained me the most is the people or pains me the most is the people I cannot help who will not. Get, I do not know how to get into action and how I can get results for them. Around about this time is when I found myself being asked to be a productivity coach, which was super interesting. <laughs> um, and then that's exactly how I saw the open loop fatigue. And no one was more than surprised than me to see these two worlds coming together. It's been the single greatest revolution. It's brought everything as a writer and director in movies, the walk on the Camino, toasters don't roast chickens, guide to making better health decisions and my role as a coach together. And trust me, the solution is actually inside you. It's completely natural um, and we use it, but we just, don't know we do and not conscious of it necessarily so that's what I'm going to share with you today and my hope is <clears throat> this is a whole new area so it's going to feel vast it's going to go into cognitive overload but I want you my hope is that I will introduce you to a new human technology I will give you an overview of it um, an overview of the solution and the principles and why it works you don't need to understand everything because some of it is actually a process um, and it needs to be experienced like in one-to-one -one work or a workshop. And I go into much more depth in the book 
Um, but I actually want your feedback on this. I would like more clear what I would like to know what you would like more clarity on, for example. So please go on this journey with me. I love it. Here's where we are at. This is what I hope you will understand. You will understand the diagnosis, why a modern mind struggles. Tick, club of done. And then we're going to give context, prescription, and a window into your loops. And I'm actually just going to use this slide as a moment for you to just write down what your major takeaway is. This is going to provide like landmarks that you're going to be able to review to see this presentation or travel through this presentation in your mind again. So please just write down the takeaway from up to this point. Was it the bears? Was it the junk loops? Was it the, the, the combination of the tyranny and the attention economy? So that it's like, it's not your fault. Why now? And now, I'm hoping you've done that. Here comes the context. Oof. Like I said, 40 years ago, I started out in the movie world. It was during the Weinstein era, so uh, tough crowd. Um, but curiosity is script writing 101. And we spent considerable time and talent learning to leverage curiosity. Curiosity is the innate. Well, hello there in all of us. And it is one of four foundational drivers. I want you to remember that piece. You're going to need it later. But here is what curiosity does for the human. It's very powerful stuff. It propels us towards the acquisition of new knowledge and experiences. It's the mental itch that needs scratching. It's a very powerful motivator for learning. It's influential in decision-making and it's crucial for healthy development. It's how we got to the moon. You know it because you watch Netflix. I know you do. Um, and it's been used by filmmakers and writers and storytellers for the longest time. You'll know it most succinctly as a cliffhanger. And it's why we binge watch. Um, and dopamine is the neurotransmitter of curiosity. According to psychology, what curiosity is actually doing is called opening a loop. That's why it's called opening a loop not my words it's an established way of looking at it it's a metaphor but it's an established way of looking at it that's why it's called that and the mind does work best in the presence of a question curiosity opened up by a question is how our mind then goes to work to find solutions so what I want you to do, I want you to actually test this live with me now. Um, you can actually feel this mechanism inside you. So I want, you're up, it's a very quick exercise. I want you to think of a statement, right? Just write a statement in the comments if you want to. It can be anything like the sun will come up tomorrow, my partner loves me. Um, I'm actually going to go with, um, a nuclear explosion would be a disaster. Now, you can feel that it's just a statement. You can either do it with me or you can do it with your own statement. I want you to change it into a question. For example, would a nuclear disaster really be a dis Sorry, would a nuclear explosion really be a disaster? When somebody asks a question like that one, I hope that you feel that your mind now goes to search for evidence to justify that or to argue with it. You're actually now engaged in cognitive tension. You're, a loop has been opened and you're in it searching for whether you agree, how many ways you disagree, and that's actually searching your past experience and touching on your values and your beliefs and your capabilities and your behaviors and your experiences. So there you go. What you have just experienced is actually dopamine, um, the neurotransmitter of curiosity that keeps a loop open. 
So now you've understood what is going on in your head. Again, I would like you just to write down a landmark. What is the takeaway from what you've just heard? And partly why I ask you to do this is to prevent the cognitive overload of brand new information just pinging through. So what was your takeaway? Curiosity is neuro is, is more ill. the neurotransmitter of curiosity is dopamine. That turning a quest uh, a statement into a question ignites it. That our mind works best in a question. What is it? Excellent. Hopefully you've now got landmark two. So I'm going to move on. Why story? Great question. I love you guys for asking me all these questions. You're amazing. Here's the interesting thing. In the months of research and interviews, I began to spot one thing. Those who do not display open loop fatigue. And they turned out to be creatives. Those with a mindfulness practice. Those with a proactive or regular, preferably daily self-care practice. And those who have a state of surrender or agency in their life. Remember the similarity between meditation and junk loops? Well, that's why all this works. So the most interesting thing is the ones who had the very least fatigue were the storytellers, especially script writers, film directors, videographers and narrative workers, people who work with narrative therapy solutions, for example. The fascinating is the root of our entire storytelling culture dates back to ancient Greece and Aristotle's observation of the three act structure, crisis, struggle and resolution. We know this from school as beginning, middle and end and a very, very common model for the structure of story looks like this. And do you know what else looks like this? Dopamine. Curiosity, I ACA, also known as the inciting incident or crisis, opens up and then in we go and we have the struggle um, to, the, to, to understand it, make, make sense. And then we come out with a resolution and what is known as the denouement. And denouement is when we make meaning of something. So we resolve and then we make meaning. And that is actually the structure of a story. And a story is a complete loop. And we do this with our experiences. We become curious. We wrestle with what we encounter, our experiences. Then we make sense of it and we turn it into meaning. And then this is our lived story. Storytelling is essentially the managing of open loops to find a resolution that is meaningful. So you know what is really fascinating? That in fact, Joseph Campbell's work on the power of myth and the hero's journey is a better model. It's a closed loop. It's a more accurate model. So story is literally the, the structure of a loop. Every story begins with curiosity and ends by tying back up the loop satisfactorily with meaning. You and I might know this as once upon a time to happily ever after, but a good loop, a nutritious loop is one that is full of meaning. And why do we need that? Well, I'm so glad you asked yet again. A story is a completed loop, which becomes this multi-layered template. It holds a full memory of emotions, senses, thought, behavior, capabilities, our values, our beliefs and our identities in a usable template of that experience and the meaning we made of it. And that's because we want those templates so that we can make better decisions and move into action. And our minds have a library of them, story templates. And we can then identify patterns. They're called heuristics. And we can process new experiences faster because of them. We can make choices and choose actions. And it's the meaning we make 
that becomes the pattern, which is why storytellers are the least affected. Um, and I want to say when we're uncertain, the mind sees an incomplete story. It's a loose end that needs tying up. It will scramble to write a story that makes sense to close that loop, even if it's the wrong meaning. But when we are in a when we have an open loop without resolution, without the denouement, the meaning, the mind cannot turn it into the meaning. So when you have thousands of loops or, or like them open in your life, your life feels meaningless, pointless, hopeless. And that's why you come out of that scrolling kind of agitated and just a bit depressed. <laughs> Um, but we keep going back because look, it's so pretty um, and it's very close to a trance. And sometimes we just want that escape out of the heavy cognitive load that we're in. So becoming a master looper is how we will navigate the bright sunny road that I promised we could go on. So as you can see, we actually already have the innate skills, storytelling. We use them in psychology, therapy, healing, and more. And it is available to all of us to navigate this way through this perfect storm of tyranny of productivity and the attention economy that has not got our best interests at heart. But, you know, we should be all willing to upskill in life. And there comes these moments when we can choose our different future and step into it. And open loop mastery is a, is a lifestyle choice. It's mastery over our mind. It's a learned skill and it will help you get through that loop. There is a framework. And, get, and ultimately, this is the framework. And yes, of course, it is a loop. And if you look really closely, it looks like the hero's journey. Um, I'm not going to go into the framework here just because I would love you to see something that you could relate to, not just a list of things. But I am being asked, who is this useful for? So who does, who can benefit? Well, mental health workers, of course, it's a wide application, um, needs more study and corroboration. But immediately, senior leaders and executives could use it for clarity, decision-making and better productivity. Entrepreneurs for prioritization, focus and communication. Coaches and educators for communication, diagnosis and results. And knowledge workers can use it for stress management, resilience, and creativity. And marketeers and content creators for engagement, story planning, and meaningfulness. We are going to move into a world where meaning is going to have a higher value. And so, there we go. Hopefully you now have the prescription, how story is the surprising solution. And we're at a landmark point. So I'd love you to just write down what did, was your takeaway from that little section? Probably shouldn't have to think about it for too long. Just pull the first thing that comes out and write it down. This is providing you with landmarks so you can travel through this presentation again. And it is actually grounding you in, so that we can just close a loop here because I'm going to open another one. What a surprise. Are you loopy? Let's find out. <laughs> okay, so there's a diagnostic quadrant, which I'm going to give you a glimpse into now. Um, but I want you to listen or read the descriptions of the four foundational loops. Uh, there are four everyday loops that most of us find ourselves in one or more of them. And then you can self-assess or or recognize them in general, know them, know them for yourself, and we will go forward with them. So here are the four everyday loops that stretch you between the past and the future. Replay loops. These are the unresolved conversations. Those are the interactions you wish had gone better. Those things that you uh, find yourself telling yourself over and again. You keep going into those ones. Most of us have that. There's a reason, by the way. Um, then there are the avoidance loops. Again, they're in the past. You're held back by something before that is keeping you from going forward to something you want. You want something, but you avoid it. You really want it, 
but you keep it, you won't move into action. So you see how that holds you in the past or is generated in the past. Then there are the to-do loop list, uh, to-do list loop. This is the experience most of us have of things that need doing. At home, at work, work from home, never goes away, always filling up. It's a miracle glass of ever filling things. Um, and then there are the someday maybe loops. Things that you will get to when, if, when I have time, I'll work on my book. I have no idea who inspired that piece. Right. So these are four, are, have, are held together by four foundational drivers. Do you remember I said curiosity was a foundational driver? Well, this is where it comes into play. And we used to use these to create characters as well as story arcs in um, script writing. And here is how I'm going to show you the anatomy of a loop. I geek out about this stuff. So I get really, really excited. And I do understand that it is, um, it's a lot. So I'm going to get a lot of out of this. And I, I hope that what you take away is some principles. At the other end of curiosity is fear, okay? Most of us know that's in play too. So these are two foundational drivers. Two more are actually protection and growth. Most of us think of these as outcomes. But when I was writing and researching the, my book, Toasters Don't Roast Chickens, I, I had um, biology. The biology of belief was in play. And I learned from that that even at a cellular level, you can't be in protection and growth at the same time. This insight really helped me to unlock my son's health. And one of the reasons that it's really important is that when you place it over the fear and curiosity axis, you actually create a quadrant where these things come into play in completely different ways. So you have an X and a Y axis, and you can immediately see that each quadrant has a pair of forces and when those two forces are in play, there's a cognitive tension created, and that is opening the loop. So this is part of the open loop mastery, which is a framework and a practice. But what I want you to notice also, by the way, have you noticed how all four of these are leveraged by the media and marketing around us? Um, here's the key takeaway. Protection and growth are actually strategies. They are outcomes, but they are a strategy first before they become an outcome. And most of us are missing that key point. So if I'm going to illustrate this, in the X and Y combination, they tell us that there's the primal emotion driving and creating the tension in play with a strategy. And what those two are trying to do is find a resolution so that they can make meaning of it. So fear and protection, they create two forces. And when they diverge, they open that replay loop. Um, I wish I could go into the psychology and the neurology and the biology of all of this. Um, but this is how we are going to use it as a diagnostic tool. Um, because it holds a key when you understand strategy. So that's the loop opens up in that pull to fill that quadrant. So imagine your loop is there being pulled out by the oscillation between fear and protection. So but in this particular quadrant, that's the replay loops. Replay loops are held open by a fear and by a, a, the, the desire to find the protection strategy that's going to work that turns it, resolves it into meaning. So this is roughly where our mind goblins live. Most of us know them. A lot of you work with them, so you're very familiar. Um, so if we think about it in story in the story concepts, it's an unfinished or resolve, unresolved story. And that's creating the tension between the two. And when we can resolve the fear and the protection strategy, we then can move forward with a template. So a story like this 
might look like when I had a conversation with my mother the other day when she was like, you never reply to my messages. It's because I'm not important to you. And this spirals into a story of being rejected, undervalued and only needed when others want something from her. That's the fear response. The mind is trying to close the loop with a protection strategy, but the strategy she has is, I just won't text. But that doesn't serve her because it means it's she's cut off from us. So it's not a useful template. So her mind keeps going back into that replay loop to try and find a better protection strategy. And the protection strategy looks like this story. I am the kind of mother who let my daughter become independent. I didn't dictate her life to her and she always knew I was there when she needed me. I am such a hero. And I, this is a genuine conversation I had with my mother and it literally in the moment rewrote her life story. Um, it was beautiful. So that's what a, the loop looks like there. And the resolution is in the reframe. It's very simple, it's incredibly powerful, but the mind is trying to find a better template and that is why reframe works because it now has a better template that it can move forward from, make better decisions and choices. So moving straight on quickly because I want to get to the end of this and I know we're at 46 minutes. Um, in this is avoidance loops. This looks like the story I had with Katerina. She will be watching this on the replay. Hi, Katerina. She's the owner of the Black Forest House and she has a vision to bring people to the house for workshops, but she's avoiding it. She has a protection strategy in place. If we find that, we can replace it with a more meaningful protection strategy. Obviously, the fear is failure, a fear of failure, or even she doesn't want to find out it will fail. She has a protection strategy. We can rewrite it. So the to-do list, well, have you ever heard of the 27 Club? Those people who die at 27. Um, there's a lot of them. Um, this is ex an extreme where it looks, but they're great goal setters and doers. They're very successful at every goal, but they have no goals. But when they have no goals or ideas, nothing to grow towards. Life feels meaningless, so there's no point in, in living. So they contemplate suicide. And the strategy is they'll overload on goals. The reason I'm telling this story is I actually met somebody through the process of research who looks like this. Um, they're currently in to-do list overdrive. They have a thousand tabs open. And yes, they do want to grow toward, they do want growth. That's why they've got to-do lists. They want growth, but they're still in fear. Um, and they're overworked and they drop things and it's frustrating to colleagues. They need a different growth strategy. Um, and that actually the, the, the clue for that is in the someday maybe loops. The someday maybe loops are just full of the detritus of things that we put off until tomorrow. And actually here, the most effective thing is synthesis. It, where this is where we synthesize something new out of all of the experience we've got and all the ideas we have. And this is actually, if we use the quadrant as a map, the desirable place to be between growth and curiosity. And the key here is synthesis and meaning. So, Nearly rounding up, we're at that very last piece on the promise that I made to you, the window into your loops. Please just write down what it is you take away from it. Did you recognize the loops? Which ones have you got? Did you resonate with some of the stories? Did you understand the tension, the relationships between the two powers at play in the quadrant? <clears throat> that's your landmark. And in conclusion, this, you now know that there is a path from this to this. Um, and it's not about working harder. Uh, it's about working smarter. But what exactly does it mean? Well, it means becoming a really great storyteller conscious and consciously aware that you're opening loops how you can close them and consciously closing them or even letting them go and this is your call to adventure i would love to take this road with you and be at the other end of this in 10 years deeply engaged in work we love with very clear minds 
focused, feeling well and enjoying life. And in actual fact, I'm just here to tell you it won't take 10 years. It just means that that's, that's the place you'll be at the end of 10 years. And along the way is this sunny path mm-hmm. in which the flowers grow and the butterflies fly. Um, and it's fun. It uh, brings a lot of lightness into life. So there we go. That, my lovelies, is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for being in the journey with me. And of course, now I have to escape and stop share and come back and see all of your lovely faces. Mel, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, You're going to find you've got lots of very interesting responses as you've asked for in the chat, if you want to look at those. Um, But are you happy to take questions now? Very much so. I would love the questions. They are insights for me. Absolutely. So if anybody has a question, yes, um, please put your hand up. Terry. Terry, lovely to see you. Mel, this was amazing. Thank you very much for putting this on. And of course, I struggle with all four loops. So the storytelling is a skill. Suggestions on creating those skills or leaning into those skills. When I do realize, oh, I've got this uh, avoidance uh, someday to do all of the loops, I realize I'm a loop. Where do I take the story? How do I do that? Give me some practical examples. So all stories need a really good ending. So where is the ending? What does a good ending look like? One that is meaningful. <clears throat> so obviously there are terrible endings to stories, um, but the one that's useful for us is one that is meaningful and you can feel meaning. Mm-hmm. So you might think um, by the end of this weekend, I'd like to have all my inbox empty. Funnily enough, that's a story. <laughs> um, But if you found the meaning for you in that empty inbox, that would create a path to it and it would draw you along. It would help you to do it. Um, And by the end of it, you would be you'd have a great sense of achievement rather than leaving that to accident. Now, that's a very practical way of doing it. But give me an example of something right now that you're aware of is an open loop. Um. Finishing a video that has been on my list for weeks, but I'm going to segue a little bit. What I had an aha when you started to answer me was that I had unconsciously closed loops, but I had closed them not with a positive outcome. I had closed them with the worst case scenario. Oh, if this is going to happen, the worst case scenario is this. And I'm like, okay, well, at least I know the worst case scenario. And it no longer bothered me. So I like how you're like, yes, close the loop, but do it in a positive and a meaningful way. Um, So yes, my open loop is this video that I've been procrastinating. It's been on my to-do list. I'm avoiding it. Um, All of that. (laughs) Do you know the ending of the video? I don't. Okay. Identify the end Mm -hmm. and then know how you're going to start it because you know how to start it because you know where the start needs to end. So mm-hmm. that loop needs to close. So you, the, the, uh, the hook has, mm-hmm. will then relate to it. And mm-hmm. then you know the hook, you know which hook, not any old hook, you the, the exact hook that it needs. And then you can just chart the, the, the pieces in between from beginning to end. I will not say it's easy because I had to do this presentation. So I know exactly how hard that is. But when you know what, how it needs to end, you can choose the right opening and so that's how a growth strategy works start with the vision reverse engineer it identify the goals and next steps that Mm -hmm. is a growth vision but you haven't necessarily seen it or growth strategy you haven't necessarily seen it for your video if you don't know the ending Mm -hmm. thank Thank you you. thank you for asking such a great question Okay, so we have Izzy and Donald waiting. So let's go with Izzy's question. Well, hi. Um, can you hear me? I can, Izzy. Okay. Um, well, as a special ed teacher, I used to write social stories for my students. Yes. If you ever heard of social stories, so so what you do is you kind of you kind of write the as is at the moment, and you put one change in. They were so powerful. They really helped the children. Mm-hmm. Let's say, uh, they were, and I never thought of applying it to myself. 
<laughs> that's very beautiful, Izzy. And thank you so much for bringing your experience in. I'm sure that's helpful. That is an, one of the other ways of helping with the, with the cognitive. So <clears throat> Terry's question was practical, something she needed to make externally. And yours is a, an internal. And I love that. It's like, well, what have we got now? Now, what if we change one thing? That sets the trajectory and suddenly the story it's takes amazing, that off. It's amazing what it, what it opened up for me, Mel. So I, I, I really thank you because I... I mean, I could write my own social stories and you kind of, you kind of do, you know, like when you're setting, you're setting something, but if you embellish it a little bit, you get more entertained by it, you see. <laughs> and we must entertain ourselves. We've heard of a muse, right? So muse is inspiration. Thank you for bringing that in is I absolutely love that. And yes, healing is uses narrative story therapy enormously. Donald. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. In the work that I do helping PhD graduates prepare for careers outside of academia, these are highly accomplished people and they live in the world of open loop. They're always striving for something that is unknown. And that open loop really creates a gap for them, which is almost paralytic that yes. they, they can't move forward. And what I, I, I really got out of uh, what you shared with us today is the power of a reframe, particularly reframe going back into their history of success and creating a better template for them. I see this as a great approach to help them overcome their avoidance loops primarily. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Donald, for sharing that. And I can see how that would be really powerful for their avoidance loops that paralyze them. You're so right. Um, I thank you for the reflection. That is incredibly powerful. I appreciate you. Vina, welcome. I'm Hello, your... thank you so much, Melanie. Uh, really, really fascinating. I have a slightly different question. We've talked about the art of the storyteller. Now, we're all ferociously bright intellectual individuals, and our inner critic can step in and say, hang on, I'm not buying this story. Any advice for our skill as the story listener? Incredible. It, I love that, because it's such... Um... It's such a lived experience for all of us, isn't it? That the the narrator in the head. One of the most powerful things is to notice it. And actually one of the most powerful things, which I'm sure you are well aware of, is to notice that it is what it is. Um, it's a storyteller. Um, and it's asking a question because it wants to protect you. We know that. But it has a strategy for protecting you. And the reason it's saying something is because it's like, I've got a strategy. Don't worry, I got you. I know how to handle this. You can't do this because I know that and I handle it by telling you, you don't do it. So the um, is noticing it and then knowing that it has a strategy in place, that it's protecting you from something, mm -hmm. but you're noticing it because it's not very useful. And I think that's where we don't realize that isn't a very useful story or you wouldn't be noticing it so okay. it's your brain is trying to get you to go back into and, and replay it to find a better resolution for a story that has more useful mm -hmm. meaning and okay. we tend not to notice it because we're busy and because yes. um, we believe it and it has kept us safe so it's obviously tried and tested and trusted but when we actually think hang on I'm actually trying to look for a better, a better story that's more meaningful that will help me make better decisions. We can pause and we can find a better story, which again would be a reframe, the proud, proud, per power of that. And of course, if you can't do it, then we, we can do this for other ways, going to healers, therapists, um, people who work with our quantum fields. Um, we're always trying to, to resolve a story that's not working for us okay i love that i love that perfect thank you so much i'm going to take that on board thank you thank you so much vina i appreciate you and welcome hi mel thank you so much that was superb loved it thank oh. you my quantum field worker <laughs> who solves some of my useless stories very quickly <laughs> oh thank you so my question is if you are 
Um, if your open loop is one which involved actual danger, so say you had something in the past which was danger, and we've got um, it, and something's happened and something similar and something similar, how can you then reframe a story where your mind says, well, that happened and it happened and it was dangerous? How can you then make a new story to close that and then have experienced something different moving forwards? So the more complex and the more real it is, the 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 more complex the solution. So it would that's why therapy is effective in this field or why somebody might come to you. You're still you are using a story that was was 100 percent informed by an experience that was very fearful and you have a protection strategy in place. And what you're seeing is underneath dopamine is actually a thing called prediction. So dopamine is trying to predict an outcome or it is instigated with the prediction outcome in place. And when dopamine is fired, it is expecting a positive outcome. But what you're talking about is a prediction error where something is doesn't work well. It is fearful and it is dangerous. So when that situation comes up again, your prediction is that it is going to be a bad situation. And it is often, if it is confirmed, that protection strategy becomes really useful and keeps you out of danger. But I'm hearing you say that what happens if you can't move, that a situation isn't dangerous. And well, maybe it shouldn't be anymore. Be. Right. But you're believing that it, it's happened right. X times before. So of course it's going to be. So yes. No, you've been, you've been, been that right. very tricky. You've predicted it uh, successfully many times. So it is very sure it is right. And so in, in interestingly, this is when I, a person like me would come to you because I'd be like, if I could fix this on my own, I'd do it. And anyway, I want it done now. I want that quantum field fiddled with. Um, a slower process suits other people, which is therapy, which is trauma therapy, which is, uh, you know, there's so many solutions out there that the more complex it is, the, the more we should expect to to invest in healing and the more we should look for different ways that help us. A simple reframe might work, but you're going to fight to keep the protection strategy in place. My advice would be, look, whilst you're pondering, ask a question because that's an incredibly powerful way of working with the mind. Ask a question. I wonder how this could be more useful. I wonder if there is a more useful strategy or there's there's a more useful story I could tell and sometimes just having a more useful story even if you don't really believe it and putting it into place starts to prove the new story is you so useful thank you for asking such a complicated question I hope I've sent you <laughs> loads of clients <laughs> <laughs> thank you Mel <laughs> Marietta welcome thank you first of all Mel, congratulations. This was an extraordinary presentation, mixing the biochemistry with, with the internal conversations. And that's where I, I would like to uh, big a point. It's amazing how all what we've heard today applies to a conversation with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the same way it applies with the conversation with others when you build trust with other people, when you first uh, uh, feel, when you first meet somebody and you feel that, or you have chemistry or you don't have chemistry. And it's exactly the same way. It's exactly the same way I use when I uh, teach my, my students or my coaches uh, about conversation and intelligence, how to build trust. It's exactly the same way. So it's it's very interesting that the conversations we have we are with ourselves, in the conversation we have with ourselves, we don't apply what we do no. in the conversations we have with others. That's when, so interesting. So tell me, Marietta, what is your business? You you um I work I work spe specifically with uh, executive uh, women, women in management to uh, increase the productivity and basically build trust. When a leader builds trust, 
the team flourishes, the work flourishes, productivity uh, right. increases. And you can so, see that you can see the exactly the same going the on. Exact, the same right. patterns. We think that the conversation with ourselves, which is much more frequent and all day going, are different than the conversations we have with others. And it is exactly the same way. The dopamine clicks, the reframe, redirect, and rewrite. But I never made the link. Until uh, well, now. thank you for making the link with all of us today. That's so beautiful. I love the takeaway I made is that this is how we can create trust with ourselves. And use exactly the same with trust with others. Beautiful. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much for your reflection, Marietta. Thank you. For that. Um, <clears throat> thank you all very much for coming on board. I is there anything, Michaela, in the in the chat that I need to address? I saw a couple of things, but I'm not sure if they are comments or I need to address them. I think um, they're mostly with... comments, Mel. Um, yeah. You could easily turn them into questions, though, of course. Well, I shall download the chat uh, and, I'll, I'll, yes, and yes. I'll answer them <laughs> out there. Uh, that, well, in that case, I want to thank you all. I want to respect your time. You have given me an hour. So I appreciate you all very much being here. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you for your feedback. And if there are 